Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Mansion House. Please can I ask you to welcome the Right Honourable the Lord Mayor, Mark Carney, and your other principal guests. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It's great uh, to see so many people here in Mansion House tonight and to welcome you all to the first uh, Sir Roger Gifford Memorial Lecture. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us today, whether here in the Mansion House or online. My name is Vincent Keaveney. I'm the 693rd Lord Mayor of the City of London. And in that capacity, I'm an international spokesperson for the UK's financial and professional services sector, a sector with many areas of excellence across the UK, but its historic heart here in London. And it was this role, that of Lord Mayor of London, that Sir Roger Gifford took up just about this time 10 years ago. During his mayoralty, Roger was a remarkable advocate for the city, often focusing on celebrating the innovations of the UK's financial sector, especially sustainable finance. Now, compared to where we are now, green finance was in a very nascent state in 2012. It was seven years before the government published its green finance strategy, four years before the Paris Climate Agreement was ratified. But Sir Roger saw promise in this type of finance. Fast forward 10 years, and what a transformation we have seen. The UK it's one of the world's leading centres for green finance, whether that's the 380 bonds listed on the London Stock Exchange's sustainable bond market, the close to 300 new green, ethical and alternative energy funds launched in 2021, or the £89 billion worth of responsible investment funds managed in the UK. Indeed, the City of London has led the conversation, hosting the Green Horizon Summit at COP26, as well as our Net Zero Delivery Summit here in Mansion House earlier this year. Now, as we head towards COP27, we must keep up this pace of activity. We must continue to push for more private finance to be mobilized into sustainable products and services. We must ensure that more funding and support goes to emerging and developing economies so that they too can be part of the sustainable solution and we must make sure that we keep this important issue to the forefront of all our financial decision making. Through today's event, we are dedicated to continuing that dialogue and capturing that commitment. Sir Roger was the force be behind our Green Horizon Summit, and the momentum he built has continued to exceed all our expectations. In many ways, he was ahead of his time, identifying early on the role that finance will play in meeting the challenge of climate change. These annual lectures will harness that dedication and that vision that we recognize in Roger and ensure that this vital work not only gets the attention it deserves, but that we create a space for thoughtful discussion of sustainable finance's priorities for the years ahead. And with that, I would like to Thank Mark Carney for being our inaugural speaker. And I'd also like to thank the president of COP, Alex Sharma. And of course, our sponsors, the sponsors of this lecture, SEB and 91. And before Anders Engelstrand, the country head of SEB, comes to the stage to introduce our guest speaker, I'm delighted that we have a mes message from the president of COP26, the Right Honorable Alex Sharma, MP. Uh, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm very sorry I can't be with you in person this evening, but with just days to go before COP27 and the end of the UK's near three-year COP26 journey, my team and I are continuing to travel extensively. We're working with governments, businesses, and civil society partners around the world to press for the implementation of the historic Glasgow Climate Pact. But I wanted to speak this evening as a contribution to the inaugural Sir Roger Gifford Lecture, 
to put on record my thanks and my tribute to Sir Roger. Sir Roger, or, or Roger, as I knew him when we first met in 1993, was my boss at SEB. You could not have asked for a more supportive, warm and encouraging leader. And Roger, as we all know, was at the forefront of the green finance revolution in the United Kingdom. He led the Green Finance Initiative. He ran the UK government's Green Finance Task Force. He chaired the Green Finance Institute. And he sat on the Das Gupta Review on the Economics of Biodiversity. The tributes that poured in following his untimely death rightly recognised him as a trailblazer, a man who left an indelible mark on the industry. In many ways, he was emblematic of the paradigm shift that we have seen in the financial sector. When I first worked in investment banking back in the 1990s, I can tell you that those people talking about green finance were very much in the minority. They were often met with curious bemusement. Now, in my travels as COP president, I see boardrooms and trading floors around the world where if you're not talking about green finance, you're being left behind. Economic opportunity is now driving climate action. Just look at COP26. When the world came to Glasgow last November for the biggest international conference that this country has ever hosted, the private sector turned up in force. And I'm sure many of you were there. Private finance in particular played its role moving the global financial system far closer to becoming a system capable of delivering and indeed powering the global transition to net zero. And so it feels fitting that my very good friend Mark Carney is delivering this evening's lecture. As you know, Mark is leading the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, or GFANS as it's known. GFANS, which was launched at COP26, is bringing together institutions with $130 trillion of assets on their balance sheets, each of them committed to net zero by 2050. And it's now time for financial institutions in attendance tonight who have not done so to join up and commit to net zero. And I'm sure that Mark will metaphorically be holding your feet to the fire on that, but of course, in his own suave and effectively persuasive manner. And for everyone in the audience, whether you're in finance or not, please set out your company's concrete science-based transition plans. And we need private finance in particular to mobilize in support of our work in developing economies around the world, which will be completely central to the global transition. Ensuring finance is flowing into our just energy transition partnerships, the first of which we launched at COP26, and where work continues to progress with countries such as Vietnam, is particularly key. Just as governments around the world are working to ramp up their own ambition, you must do the same. Finally, I know that many of you will be representing businesses and organizations, including subnational governments and corporations with footprints around the world. So I encourage you to take this work and your ambition and drive progress in markets and jurisdictions that are lacking behind. Friends, we know that the cost of inaction on climate are catastrophic. But we must all recognize, as Sir Roger did, that as well as being what your customers and your shareholders expect, the economic opportunities of action are remarkable too. And this is about protecting and growing the bottom line. Green investment is now good business sense. So together we can chart a path to a sustainable net zero future for the world. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening and I look forward to seeing many of you in Sharm El Sheikh at COP27. Lord Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, we at SEB were delighted when we were approached by Mansion House and City of London to co-sponsor and collaborate with them on this annual event to honor the legacy of our very own Sir Roger Gifford. For those of you who are not so familiar with Sir Roger, a brief professional background, if I may. Clearly all of you know what he did as Lord Mayor in 2012, but before this, Sir Roger worked in investment banking within SEB. That was in the 1980s. He moved to uh, Asia and to Japan in the mid-90s to head our Asian business, returned to London, 
in, uh, in uh, late 2000, and in 2017 he decided to de dedicate all his time towards uh, supporting the bank in developing our sustainable agenda. At that time, Sir Roger had already been approached by the UK government to share its Green Finance Initiative, which was launched to focus on growing the contribution of the financial sector to the G20 climate agenda. This led to Sir Roger sharing the government's Green Finance Task Force and finally the Green Finance Institute, established in 2019 with Dr. Rian Marie Thomas, who is here with us tonight as its CEO. Over the past few years, before his passing in 2021, Sir Roger worked with a strong passion to develop and promote sustainable finance. For SEB, he was essential in our pioneering efforts into green financing products dating back to 2008 when we advised the World Bank on their first green bond. I'm sure that everyone who knew Roger would agree that this con his contribution to addressing climate change and advancing green finance was immense. The establishment of this lecture, which will always have sustainable and green finance at its core, is a true fitting legacy to Sir Roger Gifford. And now to our speaker tonight, who really requires no introduction, but allow me to do so anyway. Mark Carney is currently the UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance, was the UK government's finance advisor for COP26 last year, Mark was previously the, bank, the governor of the Bank of England and prior to that governor of the Bank of Canada. Mark's financial and international background alongside his keen interest in a green recovery is a perfect combination for setting us on the right path for meeting not only UK's commitment but also international climate commitments. Mark, we are so grateful for you making the time to be with us here tonight. Roger would have been honored to have you as the first guest speaker at his inaugural lecture. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anders, my Lord Mayor, colleagues, friends. Uh, it is a great, great honor uh, to join you this evening to commemorate Sir Roger Gifford. As you've heard, but I'm going to reinforce this point. He was an absolute luminary, not just in finance, but in climate finance. Uh, and he was because he combined the best in thought leadership with the most determined action. And we need both. When he first took up the cause in earnest, climate finance was on the periphery, or climate itself was on the periphery of finance. Few financial budgets considered the carbon budget. Net zero was a niche but in no small part due to his inspiration and dedication that in Sir Roger's words, the action taking place in finance today are almost unrecognizable from a few short years ago, as you said, Lord Mayor. Many accomplishments, I can't list them all, but I will reemphasize his establishment and chairing of the Green Finance Initiative to leverage UK financial leadership and forge innovative climate solutions. Under his guidance, a few years later, the publication of the UK's Green Finance Strategy, which serves at the roadmap, as the roadmap for some of the most important climate finance developments in this country, and by extension, the world, from the promotion of mandatory climate disclosure to the establishment of the Clean Growth Fund, and very importantly, and not because uh, Rianne Marie will be asking me questions in a moment. Most importantly, the uh, establishment of the Green Finance Institute. His foresight also lay the foundations for the UK's leadership during its COP presidency. Under Alec Sharma's guidance and tenacity, and he has both, and he's also, he's pretty suave as well, Alec, it has to be said. Um, the proportion of global emissions uh, covered by net zero country commitments rose from less than a third when the UK was assuming the presidency to 90%. Under the Glasgow Climate Pact, countries agreed to close the gap between their climate ambition and their actions. And for the first time, nations agreed to stop deforestation and phase down unabated coal power and inefficient subsidies for fossil fuels. COP26 was also the first time that the private financial sector's role in the net zero transition was fully recognized, 
with 450 financial institutions from 45 countries making net zero commitments through sector-specific alliances as part of GFANS, which looks to spearhead progress across the global financial sector. Now, I'm going to pause for a moment and let that figure sink in. Financial institutions controlling, responsible for balance sheets representing 40 percent of global private financial assets committed to supporting the net zero transition. And there are many more around the world, particularly in the emerging and developing world, who are working hard to address similar issues, even though their economies face some of the biggest climate challenges. And the best way to honor that incredible legacy of Sir Roger is by continuing to drive change and following his approach, and I'll, qu and I'll quote his approach of taking a simple idea and building it into something much more extensive. And so what I'd like to do is focus my remarks this evening on how we make change happen. And I'll start with public policy, because change depends on governments, business and finance, all charting ambitious emissions reductions paths. In other words, they all need to undertake transition planning. They need to assess regularly the progress against those plans in order to identify gaps. They need to act to close those gaps. The financial sector can fund the necessary investments and through its own planning reveal in real time what those gaps are, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. And they can reveal where public policy needs to do more. But let me spend a moment on governments and authorities. This process begins for them with a clear commitment to achieve net zero emissions on pathways consistent with limiting temperature increases to one and a half degrees. And in pursuit of that overarching goal, governments should set interim targets, including to achieve a fair share of the 50% decarbonization that's required to stay on track by 2030. They need to incentivize and they need to track progress. Of course, they need effective policies uh, in order to move forward, but they also need to rely on independent oversight bodies to assess the adequacy of their measures. And all the while, the public and civil society will monitor progress, hold governments to account, and encourage better ways forward. And I'd say, and I've looked at a number of different jurisdictions uh, over the years, uh, let me commend the UK's exceptionally strong example. 2019 was the first major economy to enshrine decarbonization, a decarbonization goal in law. And last year, it raised its ambition to reduce emissions by 78 percent by the year 2035, 78 percent from 1990 levels, on a path to net zero emissions by 2050. So if you will, that clear, high-level ambition, interim target ambitious as well, that is step one. Step two is to put in place effective climate policies to drive action. Now, the UK has already reduced its emissions by almost 50 percent through policies such as carbon pricing, such as being one of the pioneers with emission trading schemes when it was part of the European Union and subsequently, offtake agreements that have helped scale clean energy technologies such as wind, moratoria just put in place on internal combustion engines that are spurring the development of EV production facilities and charging infrastructure, and a series of other measures from grants, um, tax breaks, funds for innovation, energy efficiency measures that are supporting the development of climate solutions from hydrogen to air, uh, direct air carbon capture. And in parallel with this, the UK is one of the leaders in building the financial architecture that's necessary for net zero including by putting explicitly in remit letters for financial uh, regulators, including the Bank of England, the requirement to have regard to climate and the net zero transi transition in their activities. It includes the decision last year of the then Chancellor, now, well, soon to be Prime Minister, um, committing to make, I think that's, that's, that's settled, that's, that one's settled, uh, committing to make TCFD line climate disclosure architecture mandatory across the economy and also cru crucially establishing the transition plan task force. That's step two, policies. Step three 
is the independent oversight. And of course, the establishment of the Ch Climate Change Committee in 2008 creates a body that regularly evaluates the effectiveness of those public policies, provides that independent oversight and rigor that is absolutely crucial to meeting net zero. This year, the Climate Change Committee made over 300 recommendations to close policy gaps because despite the fact that the UK has this 50 percent reduction since 1990, given the uh, more ambitious goal uh, in the judgment of the committee, current plans, current policies um, exist for only about 40 percent of that incremental uh, reduction. UK parliamentary committees also regularly assess progress and make new recommendations. And if I ever felt wistful about my old role, I just spent two hours in front of one of the parliamentary committees and that disabused me of that. Um, um, and in parallel, vigorous civil society, a competitive media, and an engaged public regularly hold authorities to account. So at the country level, there's this dynamic, it's familiar many of you, uh, a clear objective, ambitious interim targets, effective policies to achieve them, robust real-time accountability. Now, I'll turn to how finance fits into this and how finance can help drive change. And the key word there is help. To be clear, finance will not drive the net zero transition on its own. It's an enabler, it's a catalyst that can speed what governments and companies initiate. But given the scale of the net zero commitments of the financial sector, that scale is so large now that if governments around the world truly want a sustainable, resilient, and fair economy, the necessary finance will be there. The first step for financial institution is to mirror what governments uh, are doing. In other words, uh, and, and the example here uh, brought through the alliances as part of GFANS is by their own initiative, GFANS members have committed to achieving net zero financed emissions by 2050 to support a global transition to limit warming to one and a half degrees Celsius with low or no overshoot. To that end, GFANS members are also setting interim science-based targets reflecting maximum effort towards their fair share of the 50 percent reduction in GHG emissions that's needed by 2030. The first targets are due, it depends on the alliance, but they're due within 12 to 18 months of joining uh, the alliance, joining GFANS, and that means that COP27 is the first way station uh, to assess climate progress, and I'll come back to that. The second step for financial institutions is to develop comprehensive net zero transition plans. And in order to build a common foundation for those plans, GFANS members have spent more than a year developing a pan-sector approach to this. It's involved hundreds of finance professionals from across the alliances, thousands of, uh, or thousand uh, submissions uh, to the consultation, um, and a final version uh, will be released for COP27. These are strategic plans which address every aspect of a financial institution's operations. Now, you have a plan, you need a strategy, and you need to implement against that, and that's the next step. We've identified four key strategies for transition finance, and the first two are obvious. Climate solutions, so technologies uh, and products that enable the economy to decarbonize. The second is to finance business models that already are aligned with a science-based pathway to net zero, so think renewables. Now, there's some who would stop at these first two. But crucially, the GFANS framework makes clear that transition finance is about driving decarbonization in the real economy, not retreating to the false comfort of portfolio decarbonization. In other words, divesting your way to net zero in your portfolio. The world cannot do that. We must invest and grow. And that requires the third strategy, which is to go where the emissions are and to back Incredible uh, plans of companies that are converging, helping those country, or companies rather, converge with science-based decarbonization pathways. And the last element is, in many respects, the most difficult, which is backing the managed phase-out of those high-emission assets that will be stranded in the transition. Now, 
In order to help financial institutions determine which companies to back and which to avoid, we've developed common expectations for the transition plans of companies, companies in the real economy, and high-level guidance on how financial institutions can use sectoral pathways to assess company ambition. The fourth step in how finance can drive change is by growing transition assets across these four strategies, so all four of these strategies. And I'll come back to the progress in that respect in a moment. Final element, transparency. Just as governments need oversight bodies to assess the adequacy of their policies, the financial system needs an accountability mechanism to monitor how well the portfolios of financial institutions align with their targets. And that's why all of our work, from our global and net zero transa transition planning framework to regional tools and guidance, all of that will be underpinned by a new net zero data public utility. This will be operational next year, by this time next year, and it will provide consistent, accurate, openly available climate transition related information to allow financial institutions, regulators, civil society, all stakeholders, the general public to track climate progress. So accurate, trusted, verifiable climate trans transition data, including financed emissions, the emissions of the portfolio companies of financial institutions, targets of the financial institutions, performance against those targets, data that's openly available in a single place for free for the first time. And I want to commend all the major private data providers from London Stock Exchange, Refinitiv, uh, S&P, Moody's, MSCI, Morningstar, Bloomberg, other people that I really care about who's not written here and I've forgotten. Um, and then also the official sector, because this is backed, underpinned uh, by the OECD, by the IMF, by the UN, IOSCO as well. So we have all that. And actually, this information is a key component of how finance will drive change because it's going to provide a powerful feedback mechanism for the financial institutions, for companies in the real economy, and for governments. Stakeholders will be able to track a financial institution's climate progress, including gaps between their targets and their performance, obviously. But they also will be able to compare financial institutions with their peers and assess the extent to which any gap that exists, and there's always gaps in climate, but any gaps that exist are idiosyncratic, in other words, due to the institution's performance itself, or general, generalized, the product of broader factors beyond the institution's control, such as inadequate country climate policies or poor enabling environments. Climate laggards can be called out and strong performers rewarded. In short, we have to both mine the gap but understand why it exists. And to the extent to which it's due to inadequate country climate policies, and we remind that the gap at present between the stated climate policies of countries, so these are the policies they intend to have, not the implementation of policies, but the gap between that and one and a half degrees is a full degree of warming. Real-time feedback mechanism uh, that will help distinguish both within sectors, within institutions, uh, and feedback to governments. Okay, I've been promising a quick progress report and then I will close. So it's early days, uh, GFANS launched uh, the first wave at GFANS, it was the spring of last year. Um, that was 160 members at the time. Uh, for Glasgow, we were 450 members uh, in the Alliance. You may have read some headlines uh, about uh, people leaving or thinking of leaving. Uh, so you'll be surprised to know that we're now 550 uh, members. Um, $130 trillion of assets under those balance sheets at Glasgow. Now, how many financial assets, this is a difficult point to make, have gone up over the course of the last year? Not as many as any of us would like. Uh, $150 trillion of balance sheet uh, today. Those institutions, 550 institutions from over 50 countries, are now committed to supporting the transition consistent with limiting temperature increases to one and a half degrees. 
In parallel, we've also established regional networks in Asia Pacific and Africa to ensure that the transition to the net zero financial system takes into account different needs, different pathways, and brings benefits globally. But let me turn to individual, not specific institutions, but um, GFAN's members themselves and the progress that they're making. At present, 40% of the $42 trillion of assets managed by the first wave of uh, net zero asset managers uh, firms, we've got one sitting here, um, those are now committed to be managed in line uh, with net zero. So confidence of those firms that 40% on average of their assets would be in line with net zero. All of the 160 founding members uh, of GFANS were required to set interim targets by COP27. We've already received over 250 science-based interim targets, and there's an additional 90 targets under review and on track to be confirmed by the start of Sharm el-Sheikh. All of these targets are consistent with their commitments and timelines of when the members join GFANS in their respective alliances. One other point on progress. It's easy to forget, it's easy to forget, and I forget this sometimes too, at the start of last year, not a single bank, not one in the world, had a science-based 2030 target that included their financed emissions. In other words, the emissions of their clients, their loan book. Today, 53 banks have already done so, and we expect several more by COP27. So there was only 43 that were due by COP27, we're at 53, will be higher than that when we get there, from zero. This is substantial progress, and it's a clear sign that the hard work of implementing commitments is well underway. So, now, I'm just gonna, before I close, and I will close in a second, but I do wanna say a few words of what we're learning as part of this process, and I just wanna flag three priorities uh, that come out of the work. And the first is, and governments know this, but it bears repeating, that countries need to work harder to create the right policy environments. Uh, in last year, we had a policy call to action at COP, which outlined a series of recommendations. Next week, we'll release an update of that, uh, which updates for our findings, um, given some progress against certain levers and offers specific recommendations on others it makes clear that action by financial institutions, while critical and essential, is no substitute for governments, and certain rep responsibilities cannot be shifted to finance. So these are examples um, of these uh, that G20 governments need to do. Uh, Sectoral-specific pathways within their economies, key sectors uh, for the transition. Align the international financial architecture uh, with net zero delivery and uh, maybe we'll come back to that. I'll, I'll flag a point on that in a moment. Um, pricing the externalities around carbon, either explicitly or implicitly, and mobilizing capital flows to emerging and developing economies, particularly ensuring that the MDBs set their own net zero targets in crowded private finance. The second uh, big priority in our view is that uh, the en energy transition, I think everybody in the certainly in the country would think the energy transition needs greater focus. Um, but particularly, there needs to be greater focus on the need to scale clean energy rapidly. At present, fossil fuels power over 60% of the world's electricity and supply 80% of the world's energy. So we can't simply decree the most complex energy transition in history by fiat. Transition means transition. And this requires not just a decline in fossil fuels, but a massive acceleration in clean energy investment. The IEA's calculations around this is a threefold increase this decade in order to stay on track or to get on track for one and a half degrees. And that means that we need to scale clean energy investment such that for every dollar maintaining existing fossil fuel infrastructure, and this is an important point, we do need to spend dollars maintaining existing fossil fuel production and infrastructure for a period of time. Um, we need at least $4 invested in clean energy. Today, the ratio is about one to one. That's roughly on track. The point is it needs to scale very rapidly this decade. In fact, that's the biggest threat 
to uh, not getting on track to one and a half degrees. And then the final priority, which I've alluded to a few times and uh, the COP president mentioned, is we need to focus much more on directing capital to emerging markets and developing economies, where by the end of the decade, as many of you know, an extra trillion dollars a year in clean energy investment will be required. So in partnership with governments, multilateral development banks, we're working to leverage country platforms and just energy transition partnerships uh, to major emerging economies, including Indonesia, Vietnam, Egypt, and I want to salute uh, the tireless work of Hendrik de Toit uh, with respect to South Africa. But Hendrik, even this, he cannot do alone. Um, what we need is donor governments to pool, to blend, and deploy their risk capital at much greater scale and much more fl flexibly. Um, new uh, we need some new uh, frameworks and, and facilities for transition finance, uh, which support the managed phase out of fossil fuels, which develop the market for carbon credits and provide the incentives to retire high emitting assets ahead of schedule. So to conclude, to draw on the capacity of private finance, we've made and we see through GFANS the climate commitments on the scale that the world will require. We're developing the tools needed to operationalize those commitments, such as transition plans. We've created the governance to foster private sector leadership, and we're developing an open data utility to support accountability and accelerate change. And that's how finance can help address climate change. Not by just saying no, not by walking away, not by acting unilaterally, rather by working in concert with business, government, and civil society to catalyze, in Sir Roger's words, and I quote, the largest social and economic transformation the world has ever seen. Thank you very much. Lord Mayor, Lords, ladies and gentlemen, Ria Marie, you can come and sit if you want to come and sit, because you're going to run the show now. It's a great privilege to thank Mark Carney, but also introduce uh, the panel. And I'm not going to be one of those annoying sponsors uh, listening to the sound of their own voice while you want to hear the second course, which is a discussion uh, that follows Mark's very, very important and groundbreaking first Sir Roger Gifford lecture. And I thought, besides asking Anders to arrange a Nobel Prize for people who do something really important in the world, i.e. Move, move the needle on climate, and I think Mark, Nigel Topping, many other people in the room are all in the queue for that prize. And I really want us just to thank them for their effort and for having moved the dial in the past year. Let's just... Because you, you haven't moved the dial until you've moved the money. <laughs> and the money is moving. And of the three big crises that Mark identifies in his book, Values, which is prescribed reading to all of you after this, it's rather thick, but it's very, very good. Uh, it's credit, COVID, and climate. And I think climate is the most important, the most existential of all of them. So I want to end by just reading in tribute a paragraph out of Mark's book. And it's not just about climate, but I want you to remember that if you remember nothing else tonight because you will be able to read this on the website tomorrow. But this quote is what Mark wrote. Whenever I could step back from what felt like daily crisis management, the same deeper issues loomed. What is value? How is it grounded? Which values underpin value? Can the very act of valuation shape our values and constrain our choices? How do the valuation of markets affect the values of society? Does the narrowness of our vision, the poverty of our perspective, mean we undervalue what matters to our collective well-being? Please think about that, ladies and gentlemen, and then listen to this remarkable conversation which is about to happen. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much, Hendrik. And, and firstly, thank you to you, Mark. As somebody who was um, privileged enough to be able to describe Sir Roger as both a mentor and a close friend, as so many of us in this room and online would say too, um, this really is such a fitting tribute to him, so thank you. I'm sure if he was here, he'd be in, in strong agreement with every point you've made, but he'd also be there pointing the finger and saying, how are we going to turn some of these commitments into action? <laughs> exactly. Mark? He would be moving on. He yes, would exactly. be. And so I, I guess that's the first very unfair question. We have this, the world's largest coalition of financial institutions signed up to GFANS with these interim targets and these long-term goals, and yet we're still not seeing the money move at the pace and scale that the science is demanding of us. What more do we need from the financial services system, do you think, to make that money really move? Well, I think... Okay, they're, they're, I'd, I'd break it into two elements. So there are certain issues that the financial sector, um, so I'm not gonna cop out on the, well, governments need to do more, although I did mention this in the speech, obviously, the governments need to do more and other things. Um, I think one of the core things, and uh, I'm gonna pick up actually on part of what Hendrik was saying and, and quoting, which is you know, developing the expertise not just about climate risk management, which really was the first step, both physical and, and transition risk management, but about spotting value and spotting which companies are part of the solution. I'm gonna make it a little harder, or which actions are part of the solution. Uh, we all know that if we could find a company that did you know, cold fusion, that would be part of the solution, that's obvious, right? Or the tipping point on hydrogen or some AI application. The tougher question, but as important, if not more important, in the near term is finding those in the, if I can put it this way, the traditional economy, the high emission sectors of our economy, whether it's power generation in South Africa, whether it's uh, steel companies, auto manufacturing in this, uh, in this country and uh, where I live now in Canada as well. Um, and who has a plan, has credible plans, getting those emissions down um, and will be converging or aligning in the terms I used in the speech, aligning with these pathways. And that's what's going to unlock value because it's consistent with the values that we've all said that we're, we're looking to get on not just a path. To, well, this is the one bit where we're saying, here's a higher value, which is sustainability and, and resilience that comes with that, a future for kids and grandkids. Uh, but it is also the one of those higher values that we can count because of the physics of climate change. Um, and so it's, it's further developing that expertise. It's, it's what finance does best because it's forward looking, but you're making judgments about who's going to converge, who should I back, uh, particularly in um, those tougher sectors. Uh, and in some cases, these will be big, big, I, I, I'm gonna say bets, but big, big investments uh, that need to be made because taking an incumbent utility that you know, has a lot of traditional power generation, transforming that, transforming the management. Th those, those are tough things to do. So that's what, I think that that process of developing that is crucial. Now there's lots of other issues around data, et cetera, but that's more um, day to day. So fundamentally, more expertise, how to use that data so that yeah. we're actually making knowledgeable decisions about what does transition need to look like, who the leaders are, who the laggards are. Yeah, th exactly that. And, but it's expertise, and it's not like we go out and hire that expertise, we're all developing that expertise. And I've always felt around climate, and it was a bit with, you know, we, we worked on uh, a climate disclosure and the early stages of climate stress testing, uh, which was, has, you know, kind of cutting edge at the moment or at the time it was done, but will look quite primitive uh, five years out. And you know, this again, this city, um, I mean, this is its strength. It it innovates and it doesn't innovate once and stop. It it, it keeps going, and I, it's that process that's underway right now. And there was a key point that you made both in your remarks and also in your answer about credibility. Yeah. And the four strands of G fans, and you alluded to this, the two strands that aren't as straightforward that are to do with transition. Yeah. We're seeing a lot of pushback and we're seeing a lot of querying both the finance institutions and companies who are saying you're maybe that the claims that are being made in the name of transition might be misleading or they may not have the integrity we need. 
Are we starting to see any, is that having a deterrent effect on any companies or financial institutions that, that you see that evidence? Or are we actually seeing people double down and lean in? Well, I think there's no question that there is a lot of scrutiny on um, the validity of, of uh, sustainability claims, um, transition claims, green claims, et cetera. Um, and that's healthy. Uh, and it will continue, if not intensify, as the challenges increase, the, you know, the challenges we all face. Uh, but what's really important is that that is comprehensive. Uh, that's comprehensive, consistent, and accurate. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm, you know, we're emphasizing the importance of having this data utility, which not just has the aggregate financed emissions of whatever, you know, an asset manager, a bank, but also where were their targets, where are they relative to their targets, what progress they're making. And yes, it takes a few years to have that track record, but you know, that, that is what we're going to have to go through to have that comprehensive information and then the ability to compare who's doing well against. And look, people in financial services, um, they collaborate from time to time, but they love to compete uh, and they care about where they are in the quartiles. And I mean, everyone's friendly. We're all, you know, we have a nice reception after this, but people like to compete and that's good. That's exactly what we want. And so one of the things, and this is a, a side point, but an important point, a side point to your, your specific question, is we also want to be careful not to prescribe strategies to financial institutions. We have clear objectives. Uh, we need to have a common approach to transition planning. There's, this is what a tran you know, broadly what a transition asset is. Uh, you need to have you know, consistency in metrics, governance. We think you should have compensation type. But we're not going to tell you to go and invest all your money in this sector uh, of the moment because then you lose the, the diversity, the, the drive, the competitiveness, in some cases, the genius of, of the sector as a whole. Uh, and, and that's how we're going to power forward on this. This point about not being prescriptive, I'm sure it, it alludes to and some of the challenges we've had around GFANS and the antitrust commentary that's led, I mean, it's no secret, yeah. some people have had to leave the GFANS, but. Yeah, it's interesting, so that, yeah, so if you want me to address that, the, um, the there were three institutions that have left, uh, and actually, it's, it's a salutary point. It, they, they all left because of resource limitations that they had. They were, I mean, no, just the relatively smaller institutions. And this is hard work. You've got to collect all the information, you know, the finance emissions of all your, uh, all your companies, portfolio companies. Uh, you have to develop these plans, the strategy, et cetera. And, you know, in the end, uh, their prioritization, their resources, what they were going to do uh, was not consistent with that. Um, all the major institutions, you know, that's, resources are not an issue for the major institutions. What, they're, what they have to do is an order of magnitude more complex, given the diversity of their business, obviously, but they've taken on those challenges. Everyone's hitting their targets in terms of setting targets and, uh, and uh, doing a mission, and, and actually we're ahead of schedule, if you will, because some are pulling forward the activities. Uh, and we're growing the scale of, uh, you know, we've increased by, tw I mean, it's an odd metric, but we've increased by 20% and only $20 trillion of uh, collective balance sheet in terms of the increase So over the last year. So now you won't read that, but that's what's, that's what's happening. Um, but to your point on prescriptiveness and w where you started the question, yes, that, I that was an issue in a specific case in that there was some, uh, some guidance that was too prescriptive you will do this or you won't do that, uh, to simplify it. And when you have 40% on average of the world's financial, private financial assets, but in many countries, a much higher proportion and therefore a dominant position, uh, I think we all know, uh, I'm sure there's enough antitrust expertise in the room that you can't band together and say, we are all going to do this or we all aren't going to do that. You absolutely can say, we are going to shoot for this objective, which is what they're saying. We're going to have transparency, and we're going to have our own strategies in order to do that. And that was the tension. But that's not the tension that explains, or that's not the issue that explains people coming out. And um, I think the important thing is the momentum of people coming in and getting on with, uh, with the job. I think the other important thing is that some of these soundbite or 
headline messages that those that maybe aren't on board with what we're all collectively trying to achieve, we do need to find a, find a way of countering that. I think it will have come as news to many that there are 100 new signatories to yeah. GFAN, so that isn't the story that's been picked up. And I think it's incumbent on all of us well, uh, to be supporting those messages. Yeah, and maybe it was more, I mean, it's probably, I mean, we should I'll put on myself in that we were more focused on the execution and we weren't doing the marketing. I mean, it sounds odd to say the marketing around it, but getting that aspect of the story out. Uh, and yes, it is important. And I th if I can say one other thing on it, what's also important, and it was a point I was trying to make in the speech and lots of others, we were, uh, we were at uh, something else the other day uh, here in the city on the energy transition. And this element of the big, big thing that's going to unlock it is, I mean, it's an obvious point, but it doesn't get focused on enough. You hear a lot about no, 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 uh, because of carbon, but, and much less on what's the ramp on clean, clean energy, who's doing the ramp on clean energy, how fast is it going, what, and then, and, and, and the reason one wants the focus on that is, look, unless you ramp up, you can't shut down. I mean, that's an obvious point, but like, let's just like admit that. Um, and then secondly, the more focus there is on how well this is going or why it's not going fast enough, why is the clean ramp not going fast enough, um, the more problems get solved, right? You get a spotlight on it. And uh, I, I guess the last point I'll make is I think it's quite telling that both in this country and in the EU in the last six, nine months over the course of this energy crisis, uh, the, the significant ramp up uh, in terms of the planned pace of clean energy deployment, such that, and I'll use the EU example because it's the largest, is a five-fold increase in the, in the pace of clean energy this uh, decade. Uh, and we'll see if they achieve it. They're changing permitting in order to do that. They're doing other things in order to see it. But you start to see, like we need, like, how, did anyone read that, by the way, in the front page of the FT when they made that announcement? No. Does anyone see the focus on the elements of that? Now, I bet you there's, a, I mean, looking around the room, there's a bunch of us who are sitting there saying, well, they're gonna ramp up clean energy. That, that's a huge business opportunity. But instead, there's the focus on, you know, X, which it's, it, it's twofold. I mean, one is, this, as I say, this is what's gonna unlock it, but also, I think for the general public, knowing that these, you know, you're getting this compounding effect of solutions. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it's important for to have some um, uh, momentum behind this and, and, and a sort of positive feeling about it. And this point about in order to turn the taps off on where we don't want the capital to be going over time. And to do that, we need to find new opportunities for financial institutions to make the risk adjusted rewards that they are making yeah. from their legacy business. I mean, this is a point that I think Sir Roger was incredibly prescient about uh, mm. when he was setting up the Green Finance Initiative, the Green Finance Task Force, and, and obviously we were very fortunate to have him as our inaugural chair at the Green Finance Institute, and my team and I are working to continue, and it's a huge privilege to continue his legacy on that. And it's something we believe in very, very strongly. Yeah. It's we need to find those opportunities for financial institutions to make money from the transition so that over time they can transition and pivot their businesses away from 20th century yeah. petro economy. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that that is coming into, uh, coming into play in two respects. One is just the sheer quantum of investment. Uh, the place, the, where I worry the most is on the emerging developing side. But in terms of advanced economy, the sheer quantum of opportunity, and secondly, this valuation point, mm -hmm. is we're not yet at the point where you're getting full credit for, certainly if you're someone with a good plan to converge, you're not getting full credit for that, and that's good because then you can spot a value opportunity. But even if you're on the pathway, you do get a valuation premium, you see it in UK, or, uh, European equities and things, but not of the same, arguably, uh, quantum that ultimately will, will come, so. I'm conscious I'd love to chat all evening, but um, we are gonna have to um, only have a couple more questions. Okay. Do you mind if I change tack? Um, today's obviously been a Another momentous day in British <laughs> yes. politics. Um, we, uh, okay, we'll move on quickly from that comment. Uh, but um, how can we ensure our political leaders don't lose sight of the longer-term opportunities that you've been talking about? Um, 
despite the short-term short challenges and the profound short-term challenges that they face. Yeah, uh, it's you know a tragedy horizon issue, obviously, uh, but accentuated by interestingly accentuated by the energy crisis, other political challenges. But we've had both elements. We've had the you know necessary short-term reactions to the energy crisis, but also stepping up the UK energy security strategy, for example, uh, repower EU, uh, the US inflation reduction, all of those have an uh, uh, element of energy security alongside sustainability, but land on the same uh, solution, core solution, which is to ramp up sustainability. Second thing I'll say, um, uh, because, you know, well, I, I referenced uh, the uh, then chancellor and uh, incoming prime minister in my remarks, and, you know, one of the points, uh, and many of us were there, um, that uh, Rishi Sunak made at COP was we will have a net zero financial center in the UK. And then he said that, and then he made it tangible around mandatory disclosure, transition plan task force. There's other elements, as you know, on carbon markets. So the building blocks are there. That's an objective. And that's the type of, I think, core objective, which of course makes, well, it does two things. One, it, it ensures there's finance for UK companies and, and we, we build from there, but it, it improves the competitiveness and the growth prospects of the city of London at the same time. Uh, and having that anchor, and I think it's incumbent on, you know, Green Finance Institute, which you're doing, and the rest of us is say, okay, how do we fill that in? We have some of the core building blocks. How do we fill, what else is required in order for London to be the net zero financial center uh, of not just the UK, obviously, but of the world, and then have others, uh, you know, follow in, in, in the wake. I love the uh, mind the gap comment. I think that's mind something gap, that we yeah. definitely should speak to about City yes. of London Corporation, about making sure that we build on that in, uh, in the UK and in London. And that would be a great point to end, but I have to ask you one final question. Okay. Two weeks away from COP27, what are you hoping to see come out of COP in Sharm? Yeah. Uh, I think that what I'm hoping to see as a, uh, I would, I would say I would, would, I would love to see, and it'll be a close run thing, uh, but is uh, a breakthrough, the next phase on uh, jet piece, uh, these just energy transition partnerships, because we, a, we need those to work to get the major emerging economies, uh, to accelerate transition in major emerging economies. And if they do work, they will themselves pull through some big, bigger changes in the system. So elements of blended finance, elements of carbon uh, offset or credit markets, uh, and, uh, and actually, by definition, managed phase out as well, because that's the whole point with the just energy transition is you have to have managed phase out. So I'd like, I would love to see, I would hope to see a breakthrough on that, but we're gonna need every minute between now and then to have that. Mark Carney, thank you very, very much. Thank you for giving us the inaugural Sir Roger Gifford Lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Well, la ladies and gentlemen, I have to just say a few thank yous and starting uh, very much with a, a, a huge thank you to Mark for his uh, characteristically uh, clear, insightful uh, analysis of the challenges and the opportunities that uh, we face at the moment. Those three critical priorities that you mentioned, Mark, for, uh, the, for, for governments and other, uh, the, those outside the financial sector that are necessary to uh, allow the finance sector to do what it is committing to do. Uh, that uh, that one, one to four ratio that we need to strive to achieve in terms of, in, in, in terms of ramping up the, 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 the renewable energy, the green, the green energies that we need uh, as part of the, the solutions to the future. Uh, but also, I have to say, the, you were very positive. Uh, you just described it, I think, as substantial progress. I think it is very substantial progress indeed on, uh, uh, in, in relation to GFANS. I've been using numbers for the last 12 months that 450 institutions, 130 trillion dollars uh, of, of, of capital committed, I think I'm going to have to revise my, get the speech writers here, imagine us to start revising their speech to get the message out there that is 550 institutions now signed up, five, uh, five hundred, 150 trillion dollars uh, of assets that are, that are there. I think actually, they, as, 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 as has come out in the conversation with Rianne Marie, uh, we need to get that positive story out there on the, on the front pages. And thank you, Rianne Marie, for uh, being part of this 
discussion, such an insightful discussion over the last few minutes. Thanks, too, to Alex Sharma, to Hendrik, and to Anders for their involvement in this event, and to SEB and 91 for their sponsorship of tonight's event. Thank you all for coming. I have to say it's wonderful to see so many people in the room and so many people uh, joining us online uh, to, tonight. Uh, I wanted to say one particular thank you, and one, it was great, to, one, uh, a particular welcome, and that is to Lady Gifford, to Claire, who's with us tonight. Uh, I'm, sure, uh, I, I, I'm sure that uh, we will all, uh, perhaps another round of applause in Roger's memory.